Uh, today we are going to see a topic which is a little unusual for pediatricians, Epstein's anomaly. Now, Epstein's anomaly of tricuspid valve is a special disease uh, because it is so unique in so many ways. One is that this is the only disease which will produce multiple heart sounds. So this is a diagnosis which can be clinched just by clinical examination. And also it has an ECG, which is so characteristic that even ECG can clinch the diagnosis. This is one disease which has a bimodal presentation. Bimodal presentation means uh, it can present very early in the first couple of days in neonatal period. And if it does not, it can remain silent for two decades. So not many disease in uh, pediatric cardiology will have a similar presentation. So it is unique and let us see something about Epstein's today. We are going to restrict to its understanding of anatomy first. So Epstein's anomaly, uh, uh, one more unique thing is that, that it has varied presentations. Every single heart with Epstein's is so different. It has a significant difference in its pathology, anatomy and clinical spectrum. And another thing which is important to understand, generally we think that Epstein's anomaly is of the tricuspid valve and hence the disease of right heart. But you will see the next one hour that it interestingly involves the left heart also. So now, to understand the anatomy of Epstein's anomaly, let us first see the tricuspid valve anatomy in detail. So you can see in today's So what we will see in today's talk is the anatomy of the tricuspid valve complex and then what causes Epstein's anomaly on embryological basis and then what is the anatomy of Epstein's anomaly and what are the common imaging techniques and how does it look especially on echo uh, the Epstein's tricuspid valve. So now coming to the first one anatomy of the tricuspid valve. So tricuspid valve complex has five components. As you can see in this figure, it, this is a figure of the tricuspid valve, which is opened up. It's completely unwrapped. So the part above this is the right atrium. The part below this is the right ventricle. And this is the free wall as if it's cut open. And this is the tricuspid valve leaflets. So the annular area, this is called the fibrous annulus. You have the tricuspid leaflets, you have the corda tendini, and then you have the papillary muscle, and then you have the RA and the RV myocardium. So interestingly, Epstein's involves a significant part of the whole tricuspid valve complex. As we can see, there are three tricuspid valve leaflets, the posterior leaflet, the septal leaflet, and the anterior leaflet. The anterior tricuspid leaflet is the largest amongst the three leaflets and then you have the place where the leaflets attach to each other they are called the commissures and this is the posteroceptal commissure and this is the enteroceptal commissure similarly this will be the enteroposterior commissure and you can see here the cordy are coming from the posterior leaflet however the muscle where they attach will also be shared by the septal cordy so the posterior and the septal cordy attach to the posterior papillary muscle, the septal and the anterior to the septal papillary muscle, and the cordy from the anterior and the posterior will attach to the anterior papillary muscle. Now all of you know that a part of the interventricular septum is the membranous septum. And this membranous septum is usually located between the septal and the anterior tricuspid leaflet. So the tricuspid valve is located inside the heart very close to the interventricular membranous septum. And a little more in a cross section, you will see it this way. How is tricuspid valve related to adjacent anatomical structures? So this understanding is important because in Epstein's, similarly, it can involve the surrounding structures. Now, this is a cross section. This is an actual section of the heart where this is right and this is left, this is anterior and this is posterior. So this is how you will see the tricuspid valve in cross section. 
it is very closely attached to the mitral and the aortic valve and the coronaries. The septal leaflet is the medial one. The anterior and the posterior are respectively situated anteriorly and posteriorly close to the free wall. Now, if I want to see the relationship of tricuspid valve to the other important structures, including the AV node, here you can see that this is anterior, septal, and posterior. This is another way of a cup section of the right atrium, where this is superior and this is inferior. And here you can see that the septal tricuspid leaflet is very closely attached or it makes one of the boundaries of an important landmark which is called the triangle of Cox. So this is the triangle of Cox where you can see that one boundary is formed by the septal leaflet. This is the IVC and hence this is the opening of IVC which, which is guarded by the eustachian valve and very closely you have the coronary sinus opening. This is called the tendon of Todaro and the AV node is passing through this area. Foramen oval is, this is how it's related. So you can see that the septal tricuspid leaflet is very closely associated with AV node and also it is closely associated with the CS opening and IVC opening. Now another important uh, understanding, this is a sagittal cut and this is what we saw that the septal tricuspid leaflet is very closely attached to the membranous septum. Now this is the mitral valve and this is the tricuspid valve. And normally the tricuspid valve is more apically situated compared to the mitral valve. And hence you have this amount of difference which is called the offset between the insertion of anterior mitral leaflet and septal tricuspid leaflet. And this is what divides the membranous septum into two parts. This is the atrioventricular septum that is between the right atrium and the left ventricle. And this is the interventricular septum which, which is between the right ventricle and the left ventricle. And this amount of displacement is normal. So to what extent the displacement is normal is important. The positional tri tricuspid valve can be displaced compared to mitral valve by 8 millimeter per meter square and this is defined as the displacement index. Displacement index is the measurement in millimeters of the displaced tricuspid valve divided by the body surface area and we all know that to some extent it is normal and that some extent is defined as 8 millimeter per meter square. Another interesting thing of the tricuspid valve is if you see the tricuspid valve in a coronal section, this is anterior and this is posterior, the tricuspid valve is saddle shaped. That means the anterior and the posterior part of the leaflet is superiorly situated compared to the body. So tricuspid valve is saddle shaped and because of its peculiar characteristic of being saddle shaped, normally we cannot see the tricuspid valve, all three leaflets in a single view. So this is important that on echo to profile all three leaflets in the same view is difficult for us. And this makes the understanding of tricuspid valve on echo a little more difficult compared to the mitral valve. I hope this understanding of tricuspid valve is clear. And now we will go to the understanding of the embryological basis of Epstein's anomaly. Now for that, we go again to the embryological basis of the tricuspid valve. And it's important to understand that the tricuspid valve develops from two components. One is the endocardial cushion tissues and second is the myocardium. So it develops from the endocardium and the myocardium both. So when you have an abnormal tricuspid valve like an Epstein's anomaly, it is an abnormality of both the myocardium and the valvular development. So Epstein's anomaly is produced because of two problems, the myocardium and the valve which are defective. So now let us see what is an endocardial cushion. As you know, by 
the third week of gestation, you have these mesenchymal cushions, which are there in the atrioventricular canal area. So this is the ventricle, this is the primitive ventricle, and this is the primitive atrium. And in between, you see this sulcus sort of a thing. And this is the area where you have the atrioventricular canal. In the atrioventricular canal, you have these mesenchymal cushions which are developing. They are proliferations and they develop cushions superiorly and inferiorly, or you can also call them anteriorly and posteriorly. And you also have simultaneous lateral cushions developing. The superior and the inferior cushions slowly fuse in a week's time. Because of which, this common atrioventricular canal then gets divided into the right and the left canals. So, over a span of two weeks, in a month's time, by the time the mother is five weeks pregnant, you have two separate canals the right canal and the left canal. Now, once the endocardial cushions have fused and you have two separate canals, there is another simultaneous event which is happening. You can see here, this is a section, a coronal section of a ventricle, and this is the ventricular myocardium, and these are the atrioventricular orifices where you have dense mesenchymal tissue. Now, slowly when the blood starts streaming, it hollows out and thins out the tissue on the ventricular surface. Slowly, you have these, the proliferations which came up near the endocardial cushions will start having some amount of hollow uh, areas because of which you have the muscular tissue in the cord getting degenerated and replaced by connective tissue. And slowly these valves, which had the endocardial cushions, contain the connective tissue covered by endocardium. And slowly, because of this bloodstream making this area hollow, you have the structure of cordy and papillary muscle developing. So finally what you have is the connective tissue which is covered by the endocardium. Normally this is how the endocardial tissue, the cushion is attached completely either to the underlying myocardium initially. But slowly as the blood streams in between and this tissue is replaced by connective tissue, you have separation of the endocardial cushions from the underlying myocardium and the valve tissue loses its muscular character. This process is called delamination. That means a layer of endomyocardium separates from the underlying ventricular myocardium and loses its muscular character. This process is normal. Normally, the tricuspid valve should delaminate. If this delamination process of the tricuspid valve does not happen, it causes Epstein's anomaly. So the hallmark of Epstein's anomaly is failure of delamination of the tricuspid valve. Now we will see with this embryological basis, what is the anatomy of Epstein's anomaly? There are five components in the understanding of Epstein's anomaly. Excuse me, ma'am. Yes, Samyata. Ma'am, can you please come closer to the mic? Okay. You want me to repeat the previous slide? Yeah. Go back to how many slides before? Maybe. It's fine, ma'am. Fine, we will go ahead. Now it's here. Ah, yeah. ah, okay. Okay, fine. Okay, fine. I could not, uh, I did not see the chat box. I'm sorry. Okay, so now uh, the Epstein's anomaly of tricuspid valve has five basic components in its anatomy. 
The first is, as we saw, it's failure of delamination. That means you have adherence of the tricuspid leaflets to the underlying myocardium. And this typically happens with the septal leaflet and sometimes the posterior leaflet. So the most common to be adherent to the underlying myocardium is the septal leaflet. The second most common is the posterior leaflet and the anterior leaflet is the least common. And this amount of adherence to the underlying myocardium could be of variable degrees. And this is what gives rise to the understanding about the displacement. So the second component is downward displacement. Remember that the, this displacement is secondary to the adherence of the leaflet to the underlying myocardium. Now the displacement, if you again open up the tricuspidal leaflets, will appear like this. This is a normal tricuspid valve which is attached to its annulus. This is the fibrous annulus. And you have, as we understood, the anterior leaflet, which is the biggest, the posterior and the septal. In an Epstein's tricuspid valve, there is displacement of the septal and the posterior leaflet, along with the posterior septal commissure. So this is how you will have the displacement from the crux of the heart. And this is what you're going to measure as the displacement index. Very interestingly, you can also see that the anterior leaflet is much bigger. And because of which, if you actually see in an Epstein's, the tricuspid valve annulus is also much bigger. A little more later, we will see which annulus is this because Epstein's tricuspid valve has two annuli. One is the true, true annulus and second is the functional annulus. The third component is there is this part of the right ventricle which is not normal. As you know, this is the displacement of the septal and the posterior tricuspid leaflets because of which you have the right ventricle being very small. This is the functional right ventricle. So then what is this part of the right ventricle? We call it as an atrialized right ventricle because it is a part of the right atrium in function. So this atrialized right ventricle is dilated and the size of the atrialized right ventricle will again depend upon the degree of displacement. This atrialized right ventricle cavity has thin wall. Functionally, it belongs to the right atrium but it contracts with the right ventricle because its musculature is like right ventricle. So remember, the atrialized right ventricle functions with right atrium but contracts with right ventricle. Is it clear now? Okay, I'm getting a message again that voice is very low. Can you, can you hear me now? Can you all hear me? So, so far we have seen three components of the anatomy of tricuspid valve. The fourth is an understanding about, okay, sure. Fourth is the understanding about the anterior tricuspid leaflet. So, the septal and the posterior gets displaced. Is the anterior all normal? Not really. The most commonest abnormality of the anterior leaflet is that it is usually elongated and redundant. In this diagram, this is a cut section of the right atrium free wall which is opened up and we are looking from the right atrium into the tricuspid valve. So the septal leaflet is displaced and this anterior leaflet has become very big and redundant and sometimes it can have fenestrations 
and occasionally even the tricuspid valve can be tethered. So anterior tricuspid leaflet is usually involved, but the displacement of the anterior leaflet is rare. And the fifth component is the dilatation of the true tricuspid annulus. Now let's understand what is true tricuspid annulus. This is a sagittal section of the right atrium, right ventricle and the pulmonary artery. So now you can see here that the tricuspid valve. So you can see here the tethering of the tricuspid valve. This tricuspid valve normally should have been here. So this is the true tricuspid annulus where the tricuspid valve should have been there. However, because of the displacement, the functional tricuspid annulus is here. So this is where you align the line with the aortic annulus. So the functional annulus is much below the true tricuspid annulus. And as we see in this figure, the anterior tricuspid leaflet and the rest of the leaflets are much bigger because of which even the true annulus gets dilated. And this is the fifth component. Now remember that all the components starting from two to five are basically because of the first component, which is the displacement, which is again due to the adherence of the tricuspid valve leaflets to the underlying myocardium. So these are the five components of the tricuspid uh, leaflet when it becomes Epstein's. Now, with this understanding, let us see what happens to the right ventricle. So over time, I think you got an understanding that we have an abnormality not only limited to the leaflets, but also the RV myocardium. And as we can see here, this is the RA, this is the RV, and this is the pulmonary artery. RA, RV, RV outflow tract. And this is the true annulus and this is the functional annulus. So we divide the right ventricle into three parts. This is the inlet, this is the trabecular or the apical cavity and this is the outlet. And you can see here that the inlet is the part which is primarily involved into the malformation. The outlet and the trabecular part are the ones which are going to be normal and do the function of the actual RV. So the functional RV cavity is there in the trabecular part and the outlet part. The disease of the RV is usually present in the inlet part. And this is what has a significant part of the RV which is abnormal. And this is because even structurally the myocardium is not normal. There is decrease in the amount of myocardial fibers. Now the same disease to some extent can also be seen in the outlet part. So though we call this as functional RV, it's not anatomically completely normal because there is some amount of fibro fatty tissue more present in the outflow tract. And this is because the true myocardial fibers are much lesser. In the trabecular part, again, you can have anomalous bands which connect the interventricular septum to the free wall. And this is how the right ventricle overall is abnormal. However, the inlet part is the one which clearly does not get involved into the function of the right ventricle. So based on that, the classification of an Epstein's anomaly is somehow like this. Now you can see in the figure, do not get worried too much about the complexity inside. But primarily, it is based on the degree of displacement. The degree of displacement will finally decide the size and the volume of the true right ventricle. 
So as you go from type A to type C or D, the degree of displacement increases and the size of the functional RV cavity reduces. So you can see here that in type A, you have the mobility of the tricuspid valve and the contraction of the right ventricle quite satisfactory because the volume of the true right ventricle is adequate. In type B, you have the atrialized right ventricle which is bigger but still the anterior tricuspid leaflet moves freely. That means the movement is good. In type C, even the anterior leaflet mobility is restricted and it can go into the right ventricular outflow tract. So the mobility is not good and the contractility is not good. And type D is an extreme form which is called as tricuspid suck where you have complete atrialization of the RV cavity and only a small part of the RV outflow tract is remaining as functional RV. So based on the degree of displacement, the Carpentier classification says that you can have type A to type D. And this understanding is important because the type of surgery considered for these kids and the prognosis is based on the degree of displacement, the mobility of leaflet and the size of functional right ventricular cavity. Okay, now with this understanding, this is just a mention that based on the previous classification, we use the cell major index criteria on echo, which tells you that you take the area of the right atrium and the atrialized right ventricle and divide it by the area of the right ventricle, left atrium and the left ventricle. And this index is also a good indirect marker to understand the prognosis. You can see here that if the displacement is more, my atrialized RV cavity will become bigger and hence my ratio will become more. So smaller the ratio, better the prognosis, bigger the ratio versus the prognosis and this is called cellar major index criteria. Now as we understood so far that Epstein's anomaly is a disease of the tricuspid valve and also the right ventricle. But you can have associated anomalies also and the most common is the atrial septal defect. Now the atrial septal defect, different studies mention different percentages and it ranges from 40 to 80% of Epstein's to be having an atrial septal defect. Can you have an Epstein's without ASD? Yes, we can. Also you can have associated ventricular septal defect and patent ductus arteriosus. One important understanding with an Epstein's is related to its functionality. Because you have severe tricuspid regurgitation, you can have reduced flow into the pulmonary artery, which can over time cause pulmonary stenosis and or pulmonary atresia. And this can be sometimes functional and sometimes organic. These are the changes which can happen in an Epstein's heart in fetal life. So if your insult has happened very early and you have severe TR early in fetal life, then over time, these babies during pregnancy can develop pulmonary stenosis, even when the pulmonary valve was normally documented before. And this pulmonary stenosis can become pulmonary atresia. Now you can see that you can also have problems with the left heart, which includes a bicuspid aortic valve. You can have coarctation. You can have mitral valve diseases like prolapsing mitral leaflet, or you can even have the left ventricle, which is 
hypertrophic, non-compacted, or dysfunctional. So this is interesting that you have a left arm disease in a primarily right heart abnormality. And these associations have been found to be significantly there. Approximately 40% of Epstein's can have left heart abnormalities. Why does this happen? So initially it was thought that because the right ventricular morphology has changed, the interventricular septum is pushed towards the left ventricle because of which you have problems in the geometry of the mitral valve, LV myocardium, etc. But over time, studies have shown that you have inherent abnormality in the left heart, which could be related to the myocardial changes and also secondary impact of the geometry change of the right ventricle. And this can cause the left ventricular abnormalities including systolic and diastolic dysfunction of the left ventricle. So it's a mixture. There is something which is inherently abnormal and there's something which the right ventricular geometry can cause on the left heart. Not to forget the conduction issues. As we know, the tricuspid valve has a very close association with the triangle of Cox and the AV node and the bundle of his which passes through that. So when you have an abnormal tricuspid valve where the septal leaflet is displaced, you can have problems with the AV node where it can get compressed or it can be very close to the CS opening. Also, you can have pre-excitation. That means you can have accessory pathways because of downward displacement of the STL. And you can also have bundle branch block on the right side. So these are few things which tell you that if you have an Epstein's anomaly, you can have inherently conduction abnormalities. The most commonest being a supraventricular tachycardia related to presence of accessory pathway. And hence every child with an Epstein's needs to be explained about the risk of having SVT anytime in their life. This is not necessarily related to after surgical intervention. Now, after understanding the basic anatomy of Epstein's, let us see how the Epstein's anomaly looks on investigations and the primary modality to Confirm the diagnosis and see for associations is echo imaging. CAT is very, very rarely considered nowadays. MRI is sometimes considered as an additional modality to echo. So now on echo, what all do we see? First of all is to understand how to diagnose Epstein's anomaly and the primary crux is going to be the displacement index. Once we confirm that it's an Epstein's, it's important for us to see what components of the tricuspid valve are affected, how are the leaflets quality, how is the amount of tricuspid valve regurgitation, then come down to the right ventricle, myocardium, size and function, and then check for associated lesions. So now you can see here, this is a four chambered heart from the apical view. And this is how the Epstein's tricuspid valve looks like. So it's very important for us to understand how much should be the normal displacement. And as we discussed before, the normal displacement should be anything less than eight millimeter per meter square compared to the AML insertion. So you check for AML insertion and then you check for the tricuspid valve septal leaflet insertion and then measure this distance in millimeters divide by the body surface area. Now here also you can see in this view that this leaflet is displaced compared to the anterior mitral leaflet. However, 
this leaflet is not displaced. So it's very important for us to understand that you can miss Epstein's if you do not do a complete sweep on echo. And this displacement you divide by the body surface area and you confirm the diagnosis of Epstein's. Normally, if it's a newborn, the body surface area is around 0.2. So any displacement for more than 2 millimeters is considered to be an Epstein's in a newborn. Now, once you confirm that there is displacement, we need to see the tricuspid valve leaflets. And as we understood, that there is adherence of the leaflet to the underlying myocardium. So this is how it looks like when the tricuspid leaflet is adhered. And this is the point where you are going to think that it is displaced. But in true sense, there is adherence. This is the true tricuspid valve annulus. And this is called the functional tricuspid valve annulus. So if I want to calculate my cellar major index, I'm going to see this as the RA, this as the, <coughs> this is the atrialized right ventricle. Below this is the true right ventricle or functional right ventricle. This is the LA and this is the LB. Now, interestingly, another thing is, this is a cut section and this is the left ventricle, this is the right ventricle and how nicely you can see the tricuspid valve completely. This is what does not happen in a normal valve which we spoke initially that a normal tricuspid valve you may not be able to see all the leaflets in one section but if it's an Epstein's you can see and here you can see that this is a septal leaflet this is the posterior leaflet and this is the anterior leaflet. This is the mitral valve and this is how they are away from each other. Normally, they do not hug each other. Okay, so coming to the individual leaflets. So commonly, we use the apical view the parasternal long axis view and the parasternal short axis view. And in all the three views, we can see all the three leaflets. So let's play this. Remember that in apical view, the one which comes from the RV free wall is the anterior tricuspid leaflet. The posterior tricuspid leaflet is seen when we tilt a little posterior. And the septal leaflet is seen when we come a little anterior. So this is the septal leaflet and this is the anterior mitral valve. So this is the amount of displacement of septal leaflet. Whereas the posterior leaflet is displaced lesser than septal. So you can see all three leaflets. The posterior and the septal are going to be seen closer to the interventricular septum with a tilt. Anterior, posterior and septal. When we put our probe to the parasternal long axis, so here you can see this is the anterior leaflet and you can see how it is elongated and sail like. So the typical word used for the anterior leaflet is that it is sail like and elongated. As we discussed before, sometimes you can have fenestrations in the anterior leaflet through which you can have tricuspid regurgitation and sometimes you can have displacement. But here the anterior leaflet is correctly attached. And you can see on this side, the two leaflets which you see are the PTL and the STL. In this view, particularly, you see the PTL much more prominently. So this is the ATL, this is the PTL, and this is the STL. This is how you will see them. ATL, PTL and STL. There is in short axis. This is the aorta. This is parasternal short axis. This is the aorta and this is the tricuspid valve apparatus. And here you can see that the ATL will be seen somewhere closer to this wall. It's not very well visualized. 
and what you otherwise see is the STL and the PTL, both of which are displaced. So this is how you try to understand individual leaflets and its morphology. The third component is the tricuspid regurgitation. And you can see here that the tricuspid regurgitation sometimes is difficult to quantify because you might have multiple jets and they are in more than one plane. As I told you, if the PTL is not displaced the same as STL, then your TR may be in different planes. So it, it sometimes gets difficult to quantify. And the blue jet, what you see, is the tricuspid regurgitation. As you can see here in this figure, you can have tricuspid regurgitation in different planes. This is the parastinal long axis, where you can see the ATL here, the PTL and the STL this way. And you can see here, there are two different jets. So sometimes we use indirect ways to quantify the tricuspid regurgitation, and that is based on the IVC and hepatic vein dopplers, where if I see the IVC and hepatic venous dopplers abnormal, then I know that the amount of tricuspid regurgitation is significant. Then you come down to the septal motion. And you can see here, because your right ventricle geometry is changed, you will have a paradoxical septal motion. Paradoxical means the interventricular septum is not moving with left ventricle because it's getting expanded due to the presence of atrialized right ventricle. So this is very typical of an Epstein's. You will also find the RV free wall, which is thinned out. The RV free wall movement could be altered. And you can see here, this is the interventricular septal geometry, which is changed. Because of which you have changes in the LV shape, size and function. And the last thing which you will pay attention is the associated lesions. Left atrium, right atrium, and you see the ASD. You try to see the direction of flow of the interatrial septal defect. You see the displaced PTL here and presence of a VSD sometimes. And sometimes you can have it in presence of a corrected transposition where you have RV and tricuspid valve on the left side. So this is a corrected transposition with an Epstein's. As we discussed, you can have a reduced flow and pulmonary stenosis. This is how it looks like. And left ventricle could be hypertrophic. So when you have LVH with an Epstein's, you have to be very careful. And it's better not to touch these patients because their left ventricular and diastolic pressures are high. And you have a RV disease in diastole. And hence, it's always important that we do not close the ASD in those children. The role of cardiac MRI comes when we want analysis of the volumes of the ventricles and sometimes also the right ventricular dysplasia. So you can confirm the diagnosis. These are few cardiac images and this is how it looks like. The right atrium, the atrialized right ventricle and then the functional right ventricle. The PTL and STL are displaced. The interventricular septal geometry is changed and it's pushed towards the LV. And here you can see beautifully, it's because the atrialized RV is ballooned out, how the interventricular septum is pushed towards the left ventricle. This is the true AV annulus. And if I want to decide about the functional annulus, I will try to put a line like this. And this is how you are going to decide the atrialized right ventricle. The true tricuspid annulus is displaced and the left ventricle geometry function etc i can check it out on mri the pulmonary artery branch pulmonary arteries could be on the smaller side because of reduced pulmonary blood flow again the septal geometry you can see how much the left ventricle gets squished because of the dilated atrialized right ventricle 
So I think we will summarize today's session. It has been a little more uh, brainstorming, but I think it was important for us to understand the anatomy of tricuspid valve Epstein's anomaly for us to understand what we do in children with Epstein's. So to summarize, the morphological defect of Epstein's anomaly is primarily related to failure of delamination of the tricuspid valve leaflets. This degree of delamination could be varying in every child, which actually gives rise to huge different types of spectrums of diseases. And also that it is not restricted to the tricuspid valve, but it involves the whole heart. The anatomy of the tricuspid valve decides the surgical treatment, the type of surgery and the timing of surgery. What is the goal of surgical treatment in Epstein's is important because we can never give the child a normal tricuspid valve in RV because it's primarily a RV cardiomyopathy. So the whole aim is to reduce the amount of tricuspid regurgitation, restore the tricuspid valve function and treat comorbidities like arrhythmias. Thank you so much. If you have any questions, please um, you can put it in the chat box and we can go back and discuss out again. Any questions, anybody? Any questions? Amrita, you think everybody was there in the class? Absolutely. Yes, no questions. Okay, fine. <laughs> okay. SCT, do you have any questions? Okay, <laughs> so no questions. I don't know what to take it. Uh, I hope, you know, it didn't go completely um, uh, without any understanding. I hope there was some understanding. Uh, any questions you feel free to ask in the next month session also. It's completely okay. Okay, then Amrita, if there are no questions, should we end the session? Yeah, yes, ma'am. Yeah? Okay, so all, all of you have a nice day. See you Thank next time. Thank you, Amrita. Thank you so much. Thank you, all the participants.